Good morning, everyone. It is so good to be together. You having a good Labor Day weekend so far? At least three of you figured out that. That's good. Good deal. You get to rest. You get to have fun. Go to Tahoe. Go someplace. Enjoy this weekend. As Drew said, my name is Dan. I'm one of the staff pastors, new staff pastors here at Vintage Grace. And we're on this crazy, joy-filled journey as a church. I mean, we love Jesus and we want to follow him. But let's be a little honest this morning. That's not always easy in an upside-down world, is it? That's what we've been talking about as we go through this book of Luke, that we are living in an upside down world and we have this pursuit. We want to follow Christ, but as we experience the day in and day out of life, we kind of find ourselves sometimes flipped upside down and a little confused. Because the reality is, as we're living out the kingdom, as we're seeking Christ, we still have moments of empire leak through. Anyone agree? Those of you who had coffee who are already engaged, that's good. But that's what I find in my life. I want to follow Christ, but I still trip and fall, and I still stumble, and I still kind of embrace these old patterns of empire. See, I think we're trying to live out this king pyre. We're trying to figure out how to live for the king in the kingdom, but we still get kind of messed up and fall into these old habits of empire. And that's what I think Luke wants to show us today. So if you can, grab your Bibles, open your apps. We're going to continue in Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 46. If you were with us last week, we started a two-week look at this word rebuke, at this word called rebuke. It's not one of those words that we use a lot in our culture today. We're not sure how to always respond to it. It kind of feels a little affrontive, but Jesus is speaking correction into the disciples' lives, into their hearts, into how they are living, and the same thing is true of us. He wants to speak into our life to make us aware of things we may not even notice. And so this morning, I want us to think about what God would love to speak into your life and into my life. I like how A.W. Tozer says it this way, we must allow the word of God to correct us in the same way we allow it to encourage us. Doesn't that resonate with you? I mean, we open the word because we're struggling with something and we allow it to encourage us, but can we also let it be that sharp two-edged sword that will divide, correct, and instruct us? And so I want to invite you to let God speak to your mind and to your heart as I read the text this morning. Luke 9, starting verse 46. An argument arose among them as to which was the greatest, But Jesus, knowing the reason of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, but he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. And then our last story this morning, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. Let me pray. God, this morning, we can't think of anything greater than to meet with you, to let you speak to us, to transform us. We don't want to hide. We don't want to pretend. We want to put on a Barbie and Ken Christianese mask. We want to dive into you. And God, yet at the same time, we humbly acknowledge we don't have it all figured out. We're still falling down, going to old habits in the rush and crush of our daily life. And so help us to learn from these guys this morning, to honor you more, to cling to you more, and to take our next step with you. In your name, amen. I don't think the disciples started their morning going, dude, wouldn't it be spectacular if we just fail today? Right? I mean, we don't do that. I don't think they did that. I don't think they go, you know, this would be so awesome. 2,000 years later, they're going to open their Bibles and they're going to make fun of us. Let's do that today. That'll be awesome, won't it? See, I call what the disciples did stepping in stupid. 
and I'm pretty good at it. You could ask my wife, you could ask my mom, they're both over there. I really excel at stepping in stupid, just like these disciples. I mean, has anyone ever done something like this in the story this morning? Maybe it was your need for control or pride or arguing about the greatest or wanting to call down fire on the people driving on the 50. Any one of you? Yes, that's us. We're that way, right? I mean, these disciples are struggling to understand the mission. They're struggling to understand the kingdom and their role in it. And just like us, they still trip and fall for the empire. See, under the pressures of life, under the stressors, under the difficulties, we, ha- we default to these old habits of we're still not there yet. And that's okay because God is so gracious to move us forward. But we have to respond when he speaks to our life, when he shows up in our life. And so the question I want us to wrestle with this morning, the question I want you to think through all week long is what is leaking from your life? What is leaking from your life as the pressures at work ramp up, as the difficulties at home, maybe it's the finances, the kids, or they didn't, somebody didn't do what you expected them to do. What leaks out of your life? Because there's a lot leaking out of the disciples' life, and I think it mirrors at least my life, if not yours. So let's take a look. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. And don't forget, just a few moments ago, they're on the pinnacle of their experience with Jesus. They're on the mount, and Jesus is transfigured, and Moses and Elijah show up to hang out with Jesus. The God's voice booms over the mountain. There's shadow in the cloud, and it's like, this is an awe-inspiring moment, right? Do you remember that from a couple weeks ago? And so the disciples, what do they do? they naturally sit around and ask themselves, which one of us is the greatest, right? Don't we do that? I mean, we just experience something amazing, and then we kind of fall into this pattern of bickering with one another. And I think what's going on is they obviously know the greatest is Jesus. I mean, they'd all nod their head. They'd all share some sort of miracle story or cool thing that Jesus did. I mean, greatest, that's Jesus. Check. We got our theology down. But I think what they're arguing over is who is the greatest among us, among the 12. I think that's what they're debating. That's where I think we get king pyre. We'll recognize that God is the greatest, Jesus is the greatest, but then we fight with one another. We jockey with one another for position. We have this mix of two worlds colliding as we figure out our spiritual transformation. I mean, I can just see the argument going, can't you? And so one disciple says, well, I cast out two demons last week. You were only able to cast out one. And then another disciple says, well, I healed that little girl. She was really sick. I mean, what sort of future would she have had if I didn't show up and go, ba-ba-boo, right? And then a third disciple will say, well, you know what? Just like Jesus did, I turned water into wine, and the only miracle you did was make it disappear, right? I mean, I, I, that's what I see going on in this debate just like we do as we jockey for position, as we try and figure out who is the big dog in the company at work or through your kids' grades or through your kids' sports or with what we wear or with what we drive, we're always trying to send this message of I'm important. And I think just like the disciples, we're arguing over the wrong criteria of greatness. And trust me, church, I get it. I understand. I live in the same world as you do. I call it a selfie culture. Have you ever noticed that? You and I, we live in a selfie culture. We love the selfie. And I'm not knocking, taking pictures and posting them on Facebook. But here's what I mean by the selfie culture. It promotes that you and I belong at the center, as the center, in the full frame view, as the focus of everything in our world. You've taken a selfie, right? Again, I'm not knocking selfies. Oh, come on, you've taken a selfie. I can get my fake picture out. We can all take a selfie right now if we need to. So that we're all in a selfie. But here's what happens typically in a selfie. You put yourself with something great, right? It could be a mountain with snow on it. It could be a celebrity that you've met. It could be some sort of amazing accomplishment, like you did all the laundry this week and you have four kids. But we take this picture with something great, and then we post it on our social media accounts because we want people to associate what is great in the picture with us so that we're great. And in our empire world, we get absolutely 
consumed with ourselves, don't we? To the degree that we don't really have much regard for God or other people. We're so laser focused on me, myself, and I that unless other people and God can benefit us, we don't really have a lot of time for them. I mean, if God will bless me and people will serve me, then I'll certainly pay attention to them, but I'm not really loving them. I'm just using them. Can you relate? This is the empire that leaks out in our life. And so Jesus calls them out on it like he calls us out on it. Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts. I love that phrase. He wasn't going after their actions. A lot of time, Christianity is this behavior modification, the external conforming to some standard of the peer group they were in. Jesus wasn't after that. He was after their heart. Why does he go after their heart, after their thoughts? Have you wondered that? Because that's where change really happens. If you're a parent, that's where change really happens with your kids. As Jesus goes after our heart, after our thoughts, after the inner life, when that's transformed, the exterior follows. You may want to write this down because this is the case in all the issues the disciples have today. It's an attitude before it's ever an action. It's an attitude before it's ever an action. Because it starts in our thoughts. You know this. If you're like, my wife made blah, 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 and my kids are blah, blah, blah. How are you going to treat your kids and your wife? Exactly the same way you thought about them, right? Or your coworkers, or your neighbors, or the grocery store clerk. So I'm just going to be honest with you. Yesterday, I went to Walmart. I know, shocking. Uh, I like Walmart. Walmart's cool. But I was in Placerville, and I had to get a key made, and there's no place in EDH to get a key made. And so I'm in Walmart. And I walk up, and there's nobody at the key place, so I wait. I look at the camera. I wave. Hello. They have this thing where you push. Help. If you need help, I pushed it, waited. Finally went over to another station. Hey, can you get somebody over to the Walmart key making station? Oh, you bet. Sure. And then she comes back and goes, I got a manager. He's coming. I walk over, and I wait, and I wait. The little kiosk thing stops telling me that somebody's coming to help me. I, I don't tab it anymore. I go, Bam. Trying to, oh, come on. I ended up waiting eight minutes. You know what was going through my thoughts? I can't say them here, no. But that's the empire leaking out of me. It was only eight minutes, right? Because it's an attitude before it's ever an action. And so Jesus took and put by his side took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. You see what Jesus did there? He picked a child. Your child in this culture mattered, but children didn't matter. Maybe that's how you feel as you're trying to navigate this campus with all the kids sprouting up around. You're like, they're annoying. But this child had no fancy resume, no greatness. This child represents the least, the least able to be great in an empire world. He couldn't have competed with the disciples. He couldn't have competed with the rabbis. There is no competition here. The child hasn't done anything to deserve the title of great. He is the least, but he can do the greatest thing possible. Receive Jesus. That's what Jesus is telling us. Believe that Jesus is who he says he is and rely on him. That's what creates greatness, church, in the kingdom. It's completely opposite of greatness in the empire. Do you understand? Sin was introduced into our world through a choice not to trust. I mean, our relationship with God was broken. When Ab and Eve quit trusting, humility, and we get this all kind of messed up and false humbleness and false humility, but humility is a God recognition. It is a God surrender. That's why we hold open our hands, that we see our need for God, not just in our weaknesses, but in our strengths. In every part of our life, we need God to show up and turn it into his good and his glory. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Don't miss this. Jesus invited them into greatness. But it looks really different than we understand 
in El Dorado Hills. Just a few weeks ago, we saw this passage, maybe you remember, and he said to them all, that's all, that's you and us, that's today, 2,000 years later, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it a profit a man if he gains the whole world? best car, best house, best job, everybody bows down and fears your name and shows you respect in this world, but loses or forfeits himself. What did we gain for greatness in the empire if we lost it in the kingdom? And I just wonder as a church, not vintage necessarily, but as a culture in America called the church, if we're settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves, I see it a lot in the church, me, myself, and I, and we bring that empire world and empire mentality into the church going, what's in it for me? What am I getting out of it? I mean, are we settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves when the central message of Christianity is actually about abandoning ourselves? Because again, I know for me, my biggest problem is me. I might blame it on the Walmart clerk. I might blame it on my wife's burnt dinner. I might blame it on my kids who aren't listening to me. But my biggest problem is me. We live in, on a planet Earth in the Milky Way galaxy, but far too often my focus is zoomed on a little tiny special place called me. Anyone else relate? At least three of you are honest. That's good. What's leaking in your life, church? Luke continues with another great example, another area we struggle with in King Pyre. John answered, verse 49, John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he doesn't follow with us. I think this is one of those facepalm moments. Have you ever done that? Maybe your kids did something. You're like, what? It's a facepalm moment. Did they really run up to this guy and say, no, 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 leave the demon in him? Because you're not one of us. You shouldn't be able to do that. I mean, again, I can just see the disciples reasoning. Okay, Jesus, you told us we can't argue about who's the greatest among ourselves, but we're your disciples, right? We're better than everyone else, right? We got the secrets, right? Doesn't that sound like the church today? An us versus them mentality? We've got it all figured out. The world can just go to, you know where? You know, you know what? I mean, I, again, I just see the disciples kind of whining to Jesus. Jesus, we're supposed to have the corner on the market of this demon ousting thing. How could you let someone else do that? That's our shtick. That's our branding. That guy is wrong because he doesn't have the disciples' seal of approval. It's a little badge. If you need one, we have them in the back. They're really cool. It's only $19.99. You know, there's a cost to it. But this is how we operate a lot of time in American culture. And the empire is leaking through the church is you have to have the disciples' seal of approval. They defaulted back to empire. And I think what was really leaking out was their need for control. Their need for control. When our world gets crazy and starts spinning around, don't we grasp for control? whether it's the airplane seat or that person next to you, as life goes unexpected, we grasp for control. We need to hold on to something, our diet, our exercise, our kids. When the world doesn't go as we expect, we grasp, cling for the need for control. I mean, as a pastor, as a dad, as a husband, as someone who drives on the 50, this is my biggest area that God has to continue to work with me on. I want control. I would love to be a Jedi with the force on the 50. Boom, boom, out of my way, right? Or with my kids, you will obey, right? Here's what I'm working on. This is what God's speaking to me about. I can orient my life in one of two ways. Control or grace? Control or grace? And I see this so often with my kids. I have four kids, if you don't know, two teenagers and two fourth graders who are twins. And when I'm one-on-one with them, 
I'm a great dad. I don't mean that arrogantly. I love them. I play with them. I tickle them. I have fun. We have great talks. But when they're together, they're a herd. And my need for control just goes through the roof. Stop that. Don't fight. Stop talking. Do this. Go do that. Don't do that. Ah! Right? Am I the only schizophrenic parent in the room? <laughs> and that's what God's speaking to me about. Far too often, I work through the control task field instead of the grace relationship field with my kids or in the church. I've watched a lot of churches crash and burn because their need for control outweighed their desire to give grace. And so Jesus said to them, do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. See, our focus on Jesus allows us to see others differently. That's what the disciples are missing in this whole story. See, community is where we serve one another. Competition is where we do battle with one another to see who is the greatest. And so if we could stop using the world's status system of comparing ourselves, that would be so freeing, church. If we stop comparing the size of our outfits and the cars we drive and the houses we're in, if we stop using the world's status system to compare one another, we'd find so much more freedom and grace and God would show up in our midst in an incredible way that maybe we haven't experienced. Luke continues in verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Verse 51 is a hinge point in this book. Jesus has been speaking of his death, and now he goes to fulfill it. He's setting his eyes ultimately on the cross, on what is before him, what God has called him to, that he would go and die on the cross for our sins as Savior and Lord. This is where the focus shifts to the new ministry where Jesus is going to go and fulfill his purpose. And he sent messengers ahead of him, verse 52, who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. And so if you don't know kind of the Samaritan, uh, Judah, Galilee conflict, there's this hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans. And it gets pretty intense at times. The Samaritans were considered inbred, ignorant, foolish. They had the wrong religion. And of course, the Jews were considered arrogant and hostile and, and intolerant. And so they, they would even go and trash each other's temples over the last couple centuries. And so there's a lot of infighting. And most Jewish, good little Jewish boys and girls will go around Samaria instead of going through it. But as we see, Jesus has many times, he goes through Samaria on purpose to reach and teach. And so passing through, Jesus is traveling with a large group and preparations need to be made, right? I mean, if you have a bunch of people coming over for Labor Day, what do you do? You clean and you cook and you welcome them, right? I mean, hello, 50, reservation for 50 at Chili's, Right? I mean, this is what's happening. That's why they're being sent ahead. There's a huge entourage with Jesus, and he wants this little town to be prepared so that they can do ministry and not just preparation when they get there. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. They want Jesus on their terms. The Samaritans wanted Jesus on their terms. Come, be with us. Do what we want. Be on our team exclusively. But he's going to Jerusalem. He's not one of us, is what they're thinking. He doesn't care for us. Because if Jesus cared for us, he'd do what we wanted him to do. The way we define care. Sound like any of us? Sounds like me at times. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Anyone ever wanted to do this? <laughs> Dude, I totally want to do this. I just let me be real with you. I mean, I wish I could do fire. And this is why. Because my expectations don't meet my experience. Right? Have you ever noticed that? When your expectations don't meet your experience, you, you might say you get frustrated or annoyed. We really get mad, don't we? I mean, when my expectations don't meet my experience, kids, I put you to bed. Why are you up again for the eighth time? It's the road rage in Walmart with a cart, right? You ever notice that? Or someone didn't text you back, or they cut you off in traffic, or they, don't, they didn't say thank you for all the hard work that you've done. Or for me, I spend all this time working on my hair, and nobody compliments me. Sheesh. And so here's what I think leaked out. They viewed each other not like us. And we do it too. 
That justified the response. The Samaritan's response and the disciples' response because they were not like us. I mean, this is another disciples don't get it moment. The Samaritans reject Jesus. Why? Out of pride and their need for control. And so how do the disciples respond? Let's bring down fire on them out of their pride and need for control, right? And so here's the thought. Maybe, just maybe, we do need to call down fire into our own hearts, into the king pyre junk of our life and say, God, I, I need your cleansing fire. I need a revolution in my life. And so hear me, church. This is really key. If there is anyone you and I exclude based on color, language, age, ethnicity, wealth, because they're not like us, then we're missing out on what the gospel really means. See, Jesus erased the not like us at the cross. Jesus erased the not like us at the cross. We don't have to live in a king pyre anymore with this and them and they and we. That's not what Jesus created. He erased it on his death on the cross. And so as a church, imagine the impact if we were to break down these barriers, break down these walls of us versus them with the hope of Jesus, to be on mission with Christ, to see everyone as valuable in God's sight. I mean, that's why he's going to Jerusalem, to rescue and redeem everyone. Not just the select few or the special few, not just the us four and no more. See, our neighbors, the person in the grocery store, at work, that coworker you don't like, right? The other parents standing around when your kids are doing their sporting stuff, they are like us. No matter the color, the accent, the car they drive, or their lifestyle. Because they need Jesus just like us. Does that make sense? This is where I think Christians could really actually change our culture if we live this way. When we stop dividing along political lines and denominational lines and wealth lines and cultural lines and start unifying under the cross's line. Because that's why he turned and rebuked them. They missed it. And they went on to another village. See, Jesus rebukes them in the same way Jesus wants to rebuke us. Because there is a point in your life and in my life that we are standing in the way of what God wants to do in our life. That's what a rebuke does. It says, hey guys, you're going to miss it. And I don't want you to miss it. You're standing in the way of your own growth and your own experience of more joy and more of God speaking and revealing and living through you. So don't miss that, guys. God calls us out because there is something better for our life if we will receive him, trust him, and allow him to graciously transform us. And so wrapping up, do we recognize any patterns today? Do you recognize any patterns leaking out of your life where the empire is leaking out in anger, pride, conflict, prejudice, apathy, a need for control? What's God speaking to you about? I want to share with you three quick practical ideas to help. You might want to write these down. First is this. Your words reveal your world. Your words reveal your world. What you're really thinking on the inside, where you're really at with God, that's what comes out in our words. We might try and polish them up when we go to church or we're in our small group, but your words to your wife, to your kids, to your coworkers, that reveals your world. Because it starts in our mind and it leaks out of our mouth what we really believe in and care for. Number two, who is it that you've forgotten Jesus died for? As hard as it is, he died for the people on the fifty. a rivalry, a jockeying for position, who is it in your mind that you see yourself as better than? And what if this week you decide to show them grace instead of competition? 
And last, number three, I think that we can get so focused on doing the work of God that we forget that you and I are a work of God. I think we get so busy, so focused, trying to accomplish ministry, trying to accomplish life, trying to get it done. Maybe we're living for the kingdom. Maybe we're living for the empire. But we're so focused on doing the work of God, you and I forget that we are a work of God, a loving, gracious work of the heavenly Father working through his spirit to make us in the image of Jesus. We are a work in progress. And so we are we open to God speaking, to receiving him in our life and allowing others to speak into our life. This morning, we're gonna take communion and we just wanna give you time to pause, to reflect, to respond to all that God wants to do. There's stations up front, there's stations in back, there's probably a a gluten-free one back there. But as the music plays, allow God to just usher you in his presence. Allow him to speak to you and to reflect on what God wants to do, where he wants to take you next. Rejoice in his grace and his love as you partake. Remember all that he has done for you. God, thanks for this morning, for your grace, for the cross. God, we recognize that we haven't arrived And because of you, that's okay. It's okay to not be okay. We just don't want to stay that way. And so help us. Strengthen us. Help us to be in relationships with one another that really call out the best. To be with you in a way that you can speak that both challenges us and comforts us. In your amazing name.